Storygram Network. Hosting for this podcast is generously provided by Transistor at Transistor.fm. Hi, my name is Laura Lee, and this is It's Not About Food. So it's not about food, and it's not about weight. What is it about? Everything else. Because it's never ever about food or weight. Never ever. Not even. One time. Not ever. Ever ever. Hello everyone. This is Laura Lee Rourke from It's Not About Food podcast. Thank you so much for being here today. And today we're going to be talking about acceptance. So on the front of the card is the goddess is sitting in front of the ocean and she's got her arm around her little deer animal. And I don't know, it's a very cozy, sweet card, I think. And it just feels like she's just accepting that there's an ocean behind her (laughs) and she's on the beach. And it says in the back of the card, acceptance means to honor and respect our body and ourself exactly as we are right now. In this moment, when we step into acceptance, we stop struggling and fighting and we begin to make peace with ourselves. This empowers our body and ourself to be who we really are in this moment. It takes us out of the obsession of wanting to be different and allows us to be more present with ourselves and therefore better able to meet our needs. So when I was struggling with my own eating disorder or my own whatever recoveries I was going through, I had a very hard time with acceptance. I wanted me to be different and I wanted it right now. And I couldn't understand that to love and honor and respect myself right now, even if I wasn't doing what I was hoping that I would do, still there was a part of me that needed to accept, to be okay with where I was right that minute or right that second, and to stop fighting with myself and wanting me to be different when I was what I was right then. That doesn't mean to say that I didn't get better because I did, but it really did take that first step of acceptance of this is where I am right now and loving myself anyway. We can't get rid of ourselves. We have to get a relationship with ourselves. We might be in a relationship with somebody and the stuff they're doing is unacceptable and we can't live with it anymore. And we can pack our bags and leave that person. We cannot do that with ourselves. We have to work it through. And this is us working it through at first accepting then to honor her, then to respect, then to love ourselves through whatever hard times we might be going through. So I'm really happy to be talking to Rob Nelson today, and he's going to tell us about EFT, which I think is one of the most exciting tools that I learned how to do many, many years ago, not only for myself, but for my clients. And yeah, I'm really looking forward to uh, him telling us what that is and how that works and what a great tool it is in recovery. So take it away, Rob. Thanks, Laura Lee. Let me start just in case some of your listeners aren't familiar with EFT. I'll do my put in a nutshell version. EFT is often called tapping because we use our fingers to tap on certain key acupuncture points, mostly on our head and some points on the body as well. And this was actually an accidental discovery back in the late 70s. Essentially, tapping is a way of hacking into the limbic brain, the nonverbal emotional brain where stress and fight or flight and the freeze response are all basically stored, you can't really access or influence that part of the brain with words. It'd be like trying to get to Hawaii by taking a train. (laughs) You you could buy a ticket, but tapping has a direct and immediate effect, though, on that part of the brain. I think we're coming up into the limbic brain through the reptilian, the hindbrain, which is all about touch, by tapping and focusing on what's wrong, what we want to clear, what we want to get out of our system, the limbic brain very quickly makes it okay for that to happen. 
and it can happen very quickly. You know, I, I love that analogy, like if we want to go to Hawaii, we really, really want to go there. And so we buy a ticket and we go with our little ticket and we actually go to the train station and they go, you got a ticket, but you're not going to Hawaii on the ticket because there's an ocean. So that's why a lot of times me just saying, I think I'll quit smoking today, why that doesn't happen. <laughs> You know, right. that you have to do other things other than just make the decision. Yeah. Another example I use is not as fun. Imagine a vet coming back from the war with PTSD. It's just seen terrible things and is tweaking out. Well, you're a kind person. So you just say, hey, you're safe now. You're home. You're back. No one's shooting at you anymore. Relax. And is that going to be helpful for the vet? No. It might even be insulting, like, oh, gosh, thanks, I hadn't thought of that. And it's because the part of our brain that understands words is not the same part of the brain that handles the PTSD. So tapping is, it can create changes that are very unfamiliar. They're so vast and so quick. It's just really brilliant. So you also do something you call the matrix. And so that's like where I have it in my head or what I've read with your newsletters that you send out is that it's like EFT on steroids, more faster, better, deeper. It's a way of using EFT within the context of a specific bad memory. Like if you were my client and you had a terrible memory from say you were five years old, I would have you step into that scene as you are right now. And I would guide you through tapping on your younger self. Ah, oh, right. As if the younger self is a separate person. And we'd ask the young, hey, what are you feeling? And what did you decide about life in this moment? Or what did you decide about yourself? And those decisions that your younger self made become beliefs. You might decide I'm unlovable, or it's not safe to be in relationship. It's not safe to be thin. Is it actually a very common belief for a certain subset of traumas? I'm sure that's not surprising to anyone. And if a belief like that is running, and all the rational decision-making and self-discipline in the world is going to run into a real roadblock because this younger self, every time I try to lose weight, she doesn't know who I am, but somehow is triggered, and that's dangerous. Being thin or attractive or whatever is, is terrifying. And so I could gain five pounds just thinking about dieting. Well, and the opposite is true. I mean, the messages that I got as a child forced me to not like my body no matter what it was. So if it just went to its own little place, it was not okay. And I can remember telling uh, my mom that I couldn't see the board very well at school. And I thought that I might need glasses. And she said, you'll never catch a husband if you have glasses on. And I squished up my face and said, this doesn't seem good either. And she was like, you're just gonna have to deal with it, Laura Lee, because you're not gonna have a child with glasses on. I didn't get glasses until I was a teenager and I demanded them. And that was a decision that my mother had made. Then I hated what I looked like with glasses on because I had had this memory, this reinforced memory all those years. Like I wouldn't get married if I got glasses and I was, what, 10 years old? I, why should I worry about getting married right now? Anyway, so, you know, we make these decisions or something happens. We make these decisions when we're really young. And the trick is to remake them and make a yeah. better decision is what you're saying. Yeah, with this technique, we would tap on your younger self. You could explain, you know, mom may mean well, but she's really got some funny ideas here. And the end goal with the matrix reimprinting or my version I teach now is our practice called Hacking Reality, a new picture for the younger self that's very happy, empowering. And for you old self, it, it actually feels like a new memory that sort of, when you look back at the original, you see the new one. You know the original one happened, we're not brainwashing you, but the new memory has this wonderful feeling to it. And just as important, it's like rewriting the code in your operating system. You no longer feel, oh, if I wear glasses, I won't catch a man or sounds silly, but we change that in a very profound way. Yeah, I have the memory of my mother saying that, but I don't have the energy about it anymore. I don't care that she said that. It's worth it to me to see. <laughs> 
And I realize that the problem is hers, not mine. And you were talking about this PTSD, this soldier coming back, which plenty of them. And so you have them go back actually into the battle or wherever it was that started their PTSD. Is that what you're saying? Well, with the EFT tapping, we would need to do that. We can just tap on the presenting feelings of being anxious of certain particular triggers like fireworks or a car backfiring or things like that. And really, just with regular tapping, take the intensity away. So that's exactly what I do when I'm working with somebody who has a weight issue. And let's just for convenience say it's to lose weight chronic dieting or what have you, I pick the card acceptance because that's exactly where I start. And I'm just doing regular EFT tapping. Your listeners could quickly learn EFT and do this on their own until my client gets to a place of acceptance. It's kind of like all bets are off. When you're talking in the beginning, it's like, oh my God, you're practically doing what what I plan to say. I have noticed a couple I think pretty interesting things that I wanted to mention about acceptance. I believe for most of us, there's a seeming paradox with accepting, well, anything, but in this case, accepting our our body as it is. A lot of people, a lot of my clients are horrified by the idea. Oh, and by the way, EFT in general, tapping, we start out each round of tapping by, even though I have this problem, I deeply love and completely accept myself. It's just baked in. But this idea of, oh, no, 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 no. The last thing I want to do is accept my body the way it is, because then I'll lose my motivation to change. That's what people say. That's what they always say. Exactly. And on the surface, on a superficial level, that kind of seems legitimate But as we're tapping. And I could say this just in words, it's much more powerful with tapping. I lead people through a little process. It really isn't legitimate. So I kind of wrote out a sample of what I might say, just sort of stripping it down a little bit. But I have someone say, you want me to love and accept myself the way I am? No way. I'm too fat. I need to lose X number of pounds. If I accept myself the way I am, I'll give up. I'll probably gain even more weight. No, actually, I need to hate myself even more. If that's even possible. And then I'll finally have the motivation I need. And then round two is, but honestly, should that have worked by now? (laughs) If hating myself thin was going to work, I think that should have worked a long time ago. Oh no. What if this lack of acceptance, what if this self-loathing is actually driving my overeating? Oh no. So sort of along those lines. And then there's sort of a part two often comes in And this is just the initial 10, 15, 20 minutes I'm doing with somebody. But I've noticed with a lack of self-acceptance or you might say self-hate or self-loathing in extreme cases, there's really two main venues. Obvious one is a lot of us hate our bodies. We go, oh, I've got this inner tube on my belly or this fat under my arms or whatever. So this feeling of disgust about our appearance. But the other one I've seen a lot of is judging ourselves for having a lack of discipline or self-control. I know what I'm supposed to be eating. I know what I'm not supposed to be eating, but I can't help myself. So the judgment there, the self-loathing is about being weak, lack of self-control. And it's like, oh no, everyone who looks at me sees that I'm weak. There's no hiding it. So I tackle that right away with people too. And the reframe there is that our body doesn't want to be carrying extra weight. That's not part of the original design, we asked it to, and then forgot we asked. And now we're mad at it as though it's betraying us. So in the tapping I do, I'm basically the message is, our body's actually doing us a favor to protect us. So often from unwanted attention or jealousy or losing some important connection, but what I'm setting out to do is try to help my client step out of an adversarial relationship with her own body, which actually creates a kind of dissociation from our body, which makes us less in tune with it, less powerful, have less control. And even when it gets to levels of self-hate, it drives compulsion. It drives compulsive eating. It's very disempowering. So for me, acceptance means my body stops being an it. I stop thinking and referring to my body as it or the fat under my arms or what have you. It becomes me 
and now we're on the same team. So that's pretty cool to pull off. Storygram Network. Welcome to One Media, One Media. I'm. When you're whining with nurses. It's a place I like to call the bleed. My name is Laura Lee, and this is It's Not About Food. The art of being yay isn't just something he developed. Storygram Network. Yeah, and I think that one of the things that happens with my clients with eating disorders, you know, the name of our book is It's Not About Food, and it could be even called It's Not About Weight because it's not ever about these things. A lot of people think they're too big when that's just their weight. That's what they look like. They're genetically coded to look like that. We were just talking about somebody who was getting so much pushback from people. She had had a baby and the baby was not quite a year old and her family, everybody was asking her, when are you gonna lose this baby weight? And she was saying, you know, my body just made a human. <laughs> and I know, right? it's gonna, I'm not really worried about that right now. It'll go to where it needs to be. Maybe this is where it should be. Maybe this age with this lifestyle, with this child, with this genetic coding that I have, maybe this is my weight. And there's no reason for her to overeat or undereat. She can just go to intuitive eating and listen to her body like she's feeding the baby exactly the same way. The baby cries, the baby gets food. She cries, she gets food. The baby stops eating, she stops eating. Our bodies, they know what to do. And you're right, a lot of times we'll put stuff on our bodies. I had a client many years ago who was very, very large, way over her natural weight. But her sister was way under her natural weight. So they were actually just both in therapy around the same time, not together, but at the same time. The sister who was way over her natural weight, she was molested by her father who told her, if you get too small, I'm not gonna mess with you anymore. So she just put on weight and put on weight and she forgot that she heard that and then she made that decision. And her sister had something very similar of, if you get too big, I'm gonna stop molesting you and I'm gonna start on your sister. And so she made the decision that she would just get very, very thin. And neither one of them knew what their natural bodies wanted to look like at all until they remade that decision and worked on the incest that they had had. But they had to accept where they were at that moment and that was the best that they could do right then. And as they got older, nobody was gonna molest them anymore. They were able to go back to whatever their natural bodies wanted to be because it wasn't about that really. And I'm sure you run into this all the time with what you're doing too. Yeah, it's an interesting way to look at experiences like that, that is is pretty solidly based in actually in quantum physics. Einstein famously said that physicists, past and future, don't really exist. All time is now. And so for us, something like that is a memory. It happened a long time ago. But for our body and for our subconscious mind, it never stopped happening. It's a current event. That's the basis for stepping in there and working with that younger self. And it's really the freeze response that keeps us pinned. When fight or flight doesn't work, we can't run away, we can't fight back. Our limbic brain will flip us over into the freeze response and we just get frozen in that moment. A part of us actually splits off. That's the younger self we're tapping with. I think you had a newsletter just a few months ago that said something like, I'm paraphrasing obviously, about who's eating at night. It might be the five-year-old. <laughs> you know, There might have been something that happened to you at that time. I have clients that'll say, I am binge eating at night and I don't know why. And I'll say, did anything happen to you at night when you were little? Were you scared? Was something going on with you? Are you lonely? Are you upset? What's happening to you? Well, no, I'm okay these days, this is okay. But that little girl or that little boy inside is not okay. Just what you're saying right now. 
they're living through that every night. And I think maybe the newsletter you are thinking of, I really came across a kind of a bizarre idea. It's very counterintuitive. And yet I think it's true a lot of time. Most of the people I've worked with who binge eat have an enormous amount of shame, a sense of failure around it. And this is true for almost any addiction that I've worked with. The feeling that comes after using, in this case, binge eating, is actually what the subconscious is after. It's a horrible thing to feel that way. And yet the subconscious, the only way it knows to heal anything is repetition. It's dumb as a box of rocks, <laughs> you know? So it's just keep getting put through the ringer again and again and again, like, oh, well, maybe this time it'll go right. Of course, almost never will. But it, it's counterintuitive because why would I want to go through feelings of shame and humiliation? Well, you don't. Your subconscious does. And this is the behavior that will get you there. And I think as you're talking, it reminds me of my own self. I'm like my own little guinea pig or my own science experiment is that I would do something over and over again and then the hatred would come up and so the cycle was complete. So that's what you're talking about. I would have to resist, resist. Okay, let go, do the thing. And then all the terrible feelings come up and now the cycle is complete until the next night. And that really brings us back around to acceptance. The thing that short circuits that is tapping, well, one thing that short circuits it is tapping on the aftermath feelings. Even though I feel so disgusted with myself or such a feeling of failure, I deeply love and completely accept myself. And just tapping on that can start to take away the subconscious repetition compulsion is what Freud called it all those years ago. It can turn that off, which is blessed relief. And I like what you said a minute ago, and, and this is how I work with it myself, of even though I'm very upset with myself right now, I still love myself. I'm still a rock star. I'm still going to be okay. I'm going to be all on my side. Even though, you know, I'm eating everything in the refrigerator, I still deeply love myself. And that felt, I'm sure you've heard this before, ridiculous to say to myself because I wasn't feeling much love. <laughs> But eventually I did. There's four magic words, as best I can. <laughs> <laughs> so I love and accept myself as best I can. And then I would say, which isn't very much right now. <laughs> <laughs> right. But yeah. It really is the magic um, that unglues us, if you will, from stuck behaviors. Yes, exactly. Or the one I use with my clients is I'm learning to love and accept myself. I'm on the road to, or I will eventually, or whatever. But it's to say the thing that is happening, tell the truth about the thing, and then back it up with, and I have my own back about that. And you know, there's another, it's not a dirty trick. It's a sweet trick that I pull on people sometimes who are really locked into self-hate over something like that. And I have to tap to bring it to mind. But if I saw another woman who was locked in this self-destructive behavior, I'd want to just spit on her and push her down in the mud. Say, wait a minute. No, I wouldn't. No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. <laughs> no, I see your shocked face. Right. I wouldn't, I would never judge someone like that. Poor that person, you know, is in a struggle. I have nothing but compassion for that person. And then it's like, and I want to give myself the same compassion I would give anyone else. Okay, if you think about doing it to someone else, but that's exactly what I've been doing to myself. Oh no! <laughs> yes, exactly. And it's a good thing to remind ourselves that if we spoke to other people like we speak to ourselves, they'd slap us. <laughs> and they should, no. <laughs> you know. So I'm wondering, is there anything else that you would like to say while you have this little opening here on the show, anything you're coming up with or anything that you want to talk about that you're doing that you'd like to put out in the universe? I think you're writing a book right now, aren't you? Oh, the book's out. My book is called Hacking Reality, and people seem to like it. I wrote it in a very conversational way. So it's, it's a little different than a lot of self-help books. That's a 
all the feedback I've gotten, which is very gratifying. And it goes into tapping and quantum physics and psychology and all kinds of stuff. People can learn how to tap. My website's tappingthematrix.com and I've got some great how-to videos. It's very simple to learn. It really takes someone 15 minutes to get going. And, you know, if you could invest half an hour, wow, you're going to start changing your life maybe in a way you couldn't even imagine. It's great for people with anxiety because it can oh calm gosh. you right down. I do teach EFT workshops. I just finished my last one for this year, but I have another website, tappingthematrixacademy.com. And I have other trainers who work for me and they've got workshops coming up later this year. People sometimes want to be a practitioner and help other people. Sometimes people will just take it for their own personal growth. Yeah, it's a great tool. It's a wonderful tool. So I wonder if you would read this bottom of this card that today I will practice accepting. Today I will practice accepting my body exactly as it is. When the desire to dislike or change my body comes up, I will say, I am learning to love and accept my body and myself exactly as I am right now. That's such a great way. We could be saying that like, oh, I do not like my body. I'm learning to love and accept my body. (laughs) It's brilliant. Yeah. Well, I really appreciate you being on today. Thank you very much. Oh, it's such a joy. Such a joy. Thank you. And take care of yourself. And thank you for the great work you're doing. Oh, love it. You too. We're ships in the night here. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you for listening. And be sure and follow me on Patreon, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and it's notaboutfood.com. Thanks.